Hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's edition of Your Mortgage Process. I, of course, am your host, Greg Wareham. We got a great show for you today. So we're going to be going really deep on insurance, specifically flood insurance. And as we were trying to figure out, like, who's an expert in the area, we were really looking for someone that had, I don't know, maybe 38 years of experience in the industry. Marianne McMahon, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Uh, it's good to have you. Yeah. Now, Marianne, so tell us a little about a little bit about yourself. Um, I live in Brick. I live on the water. I'm a boater. Uh -huh. And insurance with me is a way of life. I've been in doing insurance for 38 years, and I know every bit and piece, homeowner's auto, flood insurance, health insurance, uh, all commercial lines and all personal lines because it's so super important to know every bit. You know everything, and you, you go deep with your clients as well. I know that. Yes, I do. You have to. Yeah, you got to understand the specific needs so you can address the situation. Exactly. And now you're with Conover Buyer Associates. Correct. And we're located, we're filming today at the location, at your location in Manasquan, New Jersey. That's right. This is a beautiful office. I know. I love it. It's my second home. It's fantastic. Mm -hmm. People need to check it out. It's a big office. It's a big organization that you have here. So yes. it's, it's really beautiful. So thanks for having us today. Anytime. So I know you work with all different types of insurance, but I want to start to do a little bit of a dive on flood insurance, especially with hurricane season coming up. So tell us, Marianne, why does somebody need flood insurance? Okay, flood insurance is there when there is an overflow of a body of water. Waters, when there's storms and the moon and, uh, the, and the full moon and the sun and everything, the waters come up or the storms, the, the waters come, oh, they overflow. I know with Sandy, there was five feet of water outside my house. And wow. that's why we need flood insurance because the homeowner in policy excludes flood. The commercial insurance policies all exclude flood. You have to have a separate policy for flood. Right. And, you know, you look at flood, you bring up a good point where it's an overflow of a body of water. So, you know, if I get water in my basement because it rained a lot, well, that's not a flood. No, it's seepage. It's seepage. It's totally different. That's Correct. something that would be covered by homeowners insurance. Correct. Maybe. Maybe. Depends <laughs> on their words. <laughs> right. Got to read it carefully. So I, I, a couple things about flood. Is it required if you're in a flood area? It's, a, it's very much recommended. Mm -hmm. It depends on the mortgage company. The mortgage company may, may say, this is a flood zone. Okay. You might have to have flood insurance. People who don't have mortgages do not get flood insurance sometimes. Yeah. And when there is a flood, there's no coverage. Right. And that's yeah. it. You see what I, now, did you see a lot of that during Sandy? Because there's Definitely. a lot of properties that are kind of bequeathed, right? They're generational properties. Correct. And the, when the adjusters came out, they had homeowners, but no flood. Right. There was no coverage. Oh, that's so sad. I know. I know. Now, because a lot of the people that had homes down here that got flooded, you know, you're not necessarily just rich because you have a house on the water down on the New Jersey shore. Mm -hmm. And if you didn't have flood insurance because there's been no mortgage on the property for 30 years, I mean, that's a, that's a challenge. Correct. You're absolutely right. A lot of people say, oh, hurricane's coming next week. I think I'm going to buy flood insurance. No, there's a 30-day waiting period for you to get flood insurance if you already own your home. If there is a closing... Yes, you can get it immediately. But what was happening was people were buying the flood insurance because the hurricane was coming. And after the hurricane, they would cancel it. You can't cancel flood insurance unless you sell the home. Oh, you know what? That's a fantastic point. So just to kind of reiterate what you just said. So we're coming into hurricane season, I think, starts on July 1st. Mm -hmm. And That's right. All right. Well, hey, we want flood insurance. Well, there's a 30-day waiting period before you can actually buy that coverage. Correct. And then once you have it... I can't cancel it at the end of the year? Not really, no. Okay. So it becomes something you're going to have to renew on a regular basis until you sell the house. Correct. Now, no alarms to people out there that are closing on a house during uh, hurricane season because you can acquire flood insurance at the closing. Correct. Okay. Definitely. Okay, Definitely. got it. Hey, so you, you had spoken about whether or not you need it from a mortgage standpoint. I mean, here's my experience on the mortgage end of it. If you're getting a mortgage... You need flood insurance. Exactly. Period. Exactly. Mm -hmm. You know, but there's a different, there's a couple different types of flood insurance. There's private flood insurance, and then there's really kind of the FEMA insurance, correct? Correct. Could, could you talk a little sure. bit about that and the differences? Okay. We uh, work with uh, the FEMA, and um, we work with Selective Insurance Company that represents the FEMA. Uh, they do rent the, they do rate the policies for us. And we also work with a company called Neptune Flood, and that's the private 
okay. flood insurance. And what we do is we go to both companies to see who gives the best pricing. Right. Um, I've seen situations where the building, when we rated it with FEMA, came in at 30000 and then we went to the private, and it was 6000 So mm. that's the one we're going to take. With the private, um, I wrote it for my neighbor next door. They have a pool and a fence and bulkhead, and that's going to be covered under the flood insurance. Wow. That's something that they do. And they also will offer, if it's a business, they will offer uh, loss of use. Uh, mm. that lose business income because the property is flooded. And now that's for private flood insurance. Yes, for the private. You know, and that's a really, that's a great point. When you look at FEMA and private, my, my experience is private flood insurance seems to usually be less expensive or cover more. I don't know that that's always the case. Okay. What's your experience with that? Well, like I said, I we, we, we go to both companies. Yeah. We go to both companies. And... Um, Whatever gives us the best bang for the buck, right? That's what we do, because some of them are grandfathered, so they get a lot of good credits. Oh, that makes sense. Right. Um, the other thing that people don't realize, and I'm working on a case now, where the building is worth a million dollars. Right. Okay, and um, he only has a hundred and fifty thousand dollars of flood coverage, mm. which is not good. It's probably an old policy. No, he just got it last year. He was really? closing. And he took it over from the prior owner, and he just couldn't afford to buy more. Mm -hmm. So um, what happens in that situation is that with the flood policy, you must insure the building to at least 80% of its value. Okay. So it should be at least insured for $800,000. So um, if it's underinsured, now he's insuring it for about a tenth of the value. So when he has a claim... They'll only pay him a tenth of the one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Oh my gosh! Yes, that's what's going to happen. So he got a letter yesterday from me uh, saying, "Okay, you're paying two thousand dollars for one hundred and fifty, but we got you a quote for five hundred with FEMA. The maximum is five hundred, mm -hmm. and it was only a thousand dollars more to get at least five hundred thousand on the building. So these are the things that we make sure that it's insured." Properly. I mean, that's critical yeah. because we're in a flood area. I mean, that could really devastate you for the rest of your life. Exactly. And that's what happened to a lot of people during Sandy because they bought this little Mickey Mouse flood policy instead of the maximum of 250 100 on homes sure. and 500000 on commercial buildings. Okay. So they bought, I only need 30000 I only need forty, but they lost everything. Right. Now, and if you have a mortgage on the pro on the property, you have to get two hundred and fifty thousand with FEMA. Yes. Now, can you get supplemental flood insurance on top of that? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Uh, Lloyd's of London will do that. Now, we had I, I mentioned mm. I had this condo association, and uh, FEMA wrote the first five hundred, and then he went to Lloyd's for the, the for the two million, the additional two million, and he was paying thirty eight thousand dollars. Okay. So um, it was a condo association, and they and uh, FEMA has special rules for condo associations they mm -hmm. call it rebap and they rate it like that and as i said to you this guy was paying this association was paying thirty eight thousand dollars and when we sent it we sent it directly to the company to rate we don't touch it and it came in at five thousand nine hundred and ninety four dollars <laughs> not so, a bad thing good good idea to call marianne you want to right. say thirty thousand dollars exactly wow that's exactly. fantastic i know because i was like so I get a question for you on that. Sure. So, you, so we insure the condo association. They have to have you know X amount of coverage based on the amount of units that they have. Correct. Right? So now the individual that's purchasing in that condo, should they have flood insurance as well? Absolutely. Because when you purchase a condo, you're purchasing the airspace within the four walls. Mm -hmm. So they buy what's called an HO6, a condo policy. Right. And that insures the guts, um, the, the bathrooms, the kitchen, the floors. They can also buy a standalone a uh, flood policy for their unit, if their unit's on a ground level, if the unit's on the 10th floor. What's the point? It, what's the point? Exactly. But you're on ground level. You really want to have that that individual insurance to cover the contents. How about like the drywall and the interior of the, the property? Is that something that you would need to have on your own or is that something association would cover? The association has what's called a deed. Yep. Um, They say bylaws, but I, I tell everybody it's not the bylaws, it's the deed says who owns what. I just did one two days ago. The deed says that uh, the association owns the drywall and the unit owner ensures everything in from the drywall. So Got it depends it. on what the deed says. Okay. 
And when there's a claim, the first thing the adjuster says is, where's the deed? Hmm. And uh, that's where they find out who owns what. And you know what? People don't really know. I know that. Right? You go and you're buying a condo. You don't really know what's what's included and what's not included. So it's really, really critical, especially if it's a flood area or insurance Correct. in general. Exactly. You know, understand specifically the deed of that condo association, what you're responsible for and what they're responsible for. Exactly. That's a great point, Marianne. Yes. Now, how do you know what the flood risk is because it's the, the cost is different right relative to the area or the flood zone that you're in correct there's what's called an elevation certificate when somebody is purchasing a home they should ask the realtor to get the elevation certificate so that they can get a flood quote now also if there is flood in force you're able to take over the seller's Flood insurance mm -hmm. policy. So you can be, you can take it over yeah. and you'll be grandfathered into whatever policy they Correct. had. Okay. We, we can do that. Um, if there isn't an elevation certificate and the person never had flood, when there is a survey done, the surveyor will also do the elevation certificate uh, because they will take the pictures of the building and also... Uh, to explain about the flood vents. They take pictures of the flood vents, mm. the distance between them, and that's going to give them credits for the flood. And that's how it's rated. They look at the insurance company, looks at the elevation certificate, and then rates it that way. It's the how high is it at above Sea base level. level, yeah, base flood level. So now, and what is the, what's the safe zone, like 13 feet? Like how high do you have to be where you don't even need flood insurance? Um I, yeah, I would say 13 feet. Okay. You know, but uh, but uh, like I insure a building and it's raised and underneath the building is where they park their cars. Right. But they still have flood insurance for that building because if there is a surge, the surge may knock the building down. Right. The pilings down and the building may collapse. So we have full flood on that building. But the units upstairs, they could have it, you know, for that reason. Okay. Yeah, it makes sense. Now, you had mentioned something about flood vents. And now flood vents, they have, have they been around a long period of time? Or are they like 20 years? Uh, 20 or, years. Okay. Okay, because my house is 18 years old. The flood vents go all around the house so that uh, when Sandy came, I had water in the front of my house with Barnegat Bay and in the back of my house for the lagoon. Mm -hmm. So the water came up on all sides of my house. My house was just sticking up from the water. And the flood vents opened so there's no pressure on the foundation of the home. That's why they open. Mm. They floated away. And, but... I had water underneath in the crawl space. That's what the flood vents are for to prevent the, the knocking it over. Yes, and like a water flood, and it probably and it reduces. To your point, it reduces your risk on it, which exactly. in turn reduces your cost on it. Exactly. Now, are flood vents are they expensive to put in? It depends if you can. If you have, uh, if you're on a uh, a crawl space, you can add them. Sure. You can add them. Okay. You know, so and, um, and sometimes you just can't do it. Not right because it's flat. So what's the point at which you get, Marianne, where you have to actually raise your house? Because you saw so much of that after Sandy. Yes. That people were raising their house. Like, could you tell us a little bit about that? Like, when do you, how do you make the determination you got to raise it? Um, where I live, I would say 90% of my neighbors had their houses raised. I saw it every single day. Okay. Most of the houses where I were, they were, they were flat. They were on, um, on slabs. Okay. So they were concerned that there would be another flood. And there has been. It's just that the waters come up. Right. Okay. And then the waters will get into the house. So uh, they were grants. People got grants and they could raise their houses. And what they did was they, they were cinder blocks mm -hmm. and pilings. And also they put hurricane straps to hold the house on. Because I saw the house across from me just get lifted up and go into the bay. Wow. Yes, because they were no they were bungalows. They were bungalows, okay. glorified bungalows. Okay. And that's, well, that's what terrible. Was yeah. So the houses were um So know. now when they raise it, then they strap the house as well? Yes. Hurricane huh. straps so the we wind doesn't do blow it off. Okay. Yeah, I saw them do it. It's engineering, so like amazing. I know. Let's lift it's the great. house out, let's strap it down and make sure it doesn't go anywhere. That's right. Exactly. Huh. And and my house was like built that way. With hurricane straps, and I also have hurricane windows, so that the wind doesn't blow the windows off. The what house. do they have to be rated for for a hurricane window? It's like a certain miles per hour. Yeah, it's like sixty miles an hour. Okay. Yeah, Anderson makes hurricane windows. Okay. Yeah, so um, I, we never had a problem. Hmm. Never had a problem. 
Yeah, you know what? That's uh, that's really interesting. There's so so you, you got to raise the house out. I also think that if you're going to purchase a house in a particular flood area and you need a mortgage, some houses have to be raised, or you can't even lend on them. Correct. Correct. It's really changed so much since Sandy because prior to that, it didn't. It's like people didn't even talk about flooding in our area. Right. But if the house has to be raised, you can get a grant if the house is flooded three times in a period of month. It okay. might be like the water keeps coming up, the water keeps coming up. So that's what happens. Okay. But otherwise, you're going to have to pay to get it raised. Yeah, and it's, it's not cheap to raise it. No, it's better off knocking it down and starting over again. Yeah, that's a good point. Well, yeah. so when you look at cost on flood insurance, it's by the area, right, what your elevation is. Mm-hmm. And that's really the number one thing, right? Yes. Like, are you going to flood a 1% chance per year, right? Is it less than 1%? Mm-hmm. Could you talk a little bit about that, like the costing on flood and what different things look like? Um, the higher the house is off the ground, the cheaper it gets. Now, <laughs> the house, that's it. That's it. Now, right. the house next door to me was built it's a modular and it's about 12 feet off the ground and okay. that downstairs is just an open the area they put they have a washing machine and a uh, refrigerator and he's only paying five hundred dollars a year for flood insurance that's it because it's so far up off the ground right uh, but the floods may hit the house and he has some sort of a metal around it enclosure mm-hmm. but it's on piling so it's not going to fall over okay because when they build houses now, they're they're about a dozen pilings, and uh, my house shakes and everything comes off the walls when they're doing this. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that's what, how it's determined. Now, can anybody get flood insurance, or do you have to be in a flood zone? Some people feel that they want flood insurance, mm-hmm. and we'll give it to them. Okay. It's not a flood zone, but it'll be very inexpensive, but they have it. They're just concerned. Right. Because sometimes there's underground streams. I know right. even in the center of the state. Or little little babbling streams. Yeah. And that's water that may get into the house. That's funny. You know, that happened to my parents live in Massachusetts. And there was a stream next to my house growing up. The thing would fill up with water every once in a while. But then they they actually had a flood. And it was something like every hundred years or something, a flood comes through. It destroyed their house. Yeah. Destroyed it. And I don't know that people really understand if you haven't seen it. And I know you've seen it firsthand, as have I. Mm -hmm. Like, it's devastating. Like, you can't live in your house. You lose all your stuff. The pictures of the the kids, of family, because you keep that stuff in the lower part of your house, generally. Exactly. Right? And exactly. it's just destroyed. I just remember my mother, because the, the uh, camera crew showed up from news up in Massachusetts. It's got, like, pictures of the kids drying out, you know, old schoolwork, stuff like that. Like, it's really sad. Right. And to see everybody's belongings on the curb. Right. That was the scariest and upsetting thing for me. Everybody's things there. Right. Because the furn- furniture got wet. You can't keep it. You got to get rid of it. Right. So that was, and, and everybody's belongings, because mm-hmm. I was across from uh, Mantaloking, and the way the surge oh, came, all of their yeah. stuff came over to my house. As a matter of fact, I got a, like a church table that okay. came into my yard, and I took it and cleaned it up and refinished it, and I still have it. You still have it? And per people's belongings, like, right. you know, Mailboxes, jewelry boxes, clothes, cars. Right. Cars were in the water. A lot of people on the Browery Island thought nothing was going to happen, but it right. did. Right. But it did. Now, if you're renting, do you need flood insurance? Yes, you can get flood insurance for your contents. Got it. Just for your belongings, your furniture, your dishes, your TVs. Sure. Right. Okay. So you can get a you're renting and probably advise it, right? If you're in a flood area, you should probably be able to insure the. Your contents. Right, exactly. The other thing is that some people, a lot of people have secondary homes down here mm-hmm. and they have flood insurance. And it's a kind of a lesser policy because they have another place to go if there's a flood and they put a $250 fee on it. Okay. Because it's, it's the secondary home. And we tell everybody that because they, they feel you have another home to go back to. So it's not as bad. That makes sense. So if, and if I have a flood and it's my primary residence, does flood insurance cover the cost of me living somewhere else when I can't live in my house? Not at all. There's oh. no, no loss of income, no loss of use on wow. the flood. So on commercial, there's some different policies you that can do you it on? Add it. You okay. can add it. But it doesn't exist in FEMA or in the private sector? I believe there's some in the private sector. Okay. 
but um, I haven't really seen it because most of the ones that I'm doing are for secondary homes. Sure, that makes sense. Yeah, because they don't need it. They have to go somewhere else. Oh, that's great insight on everything, Marianne. Uh, Marianne, we're going to take a quick break, and we're going to come right back in about two minutes. So everyone, Marianne McMahon, Greg Wareham, Your Mortgage Process. We'll be right back at you. Thank you. Hey, so welcome back, everyone. I'm Greg Wareham, Marianne McMahon. You're fantastic, Marianne. Thank, Thank you so you much. Thank you very much. I mean, you know, uh, you have a plethora of information. We really appreciate your knowledge in this, in this industry. So, you know, I was thinking a little bit during the break about my parents and when they had a flood. And when they had a flood, they were fortunate enough, they had the money to kind of start fixing things very quickly and then wait for the flood insurance policy to kick in. Could you talk a little bit about the claims process? Sure. Okay. Whenever the, the water, okay, overflow a body of water and the adjusters come out, they don't want you to throw away anything. Okay. But if it's so wet and it smells, take pictures and show the adjuster, print them. This is, this is the stuff. I couldn't keep it anymore. I was waiting for you. Some of those adjusters, when there was a flood, don't forget, everybody's flooded. Right. So they have to throw them away, but there's plenty of pictures. And you tell them this is the overflow of a body of water. As I told everybody w during Sandy, when the adjuster comes, you love him. Treat him <laughs> nicely. Right. And give him coffee or whatever because you want him to keep him happy and to, you know, um, adjust the claim properly. Now, as I mentioned earlier, that the, the, how, the building has to be at least 80% of the value yep. for you to get replacement cost. Right. Now, in lower levels, obviously, if you have a basement, that's going to flood first. Sure. It will cover the mechanicals, which is your heating and air conditioning units. It will be um, the uh, air conditioning, heating and air conditioning, a refrigerator, um, a, the generators will be up high. Uh, we hope, right. and any of uh, the uh, freezer. Now, they consider a washer and a dryer contents not part of the building. So they will cover all of that in the lower levels, and mm -hmm. that's it. Okay. And then on the first level, they'll cover your furniture. They'll cover your con your contents, your clothes, whatever. You just have to make sure you make a list and give him a list, and you know your, cl your claim should be adjusted. Your agent should be there to hold your hand. I've gone out on okay. a lot of claims. And, you know, I've, I've prepped people, of, you know, make sure you have everything lined up when you talk to the adjuster, what you lost, where the water came from, et cetera, because you have to get that, the, the sheetrock cut out, a ASAP, or else it goes into mold. You sure. Wanna, you want to get a real problem. Mold. Yeah. So that's, and you have to try to take pictures. And it, and I know you would think it would be intuitive, but when you have a flood, you know, that's a very, very stressful situation. You have to remember to document what it all looked like, document mm -hmm. your contents, all of, all of that. So you have something, to your point, to show to the adjuster. And as you're talking about it, I'm thinking, too, so if I have a flood in my house and there's water in the basement, should I leave the house? Right? Can you have an electrical issue? Does that ever happen? Or is power usually... I, I know we're, we're not experts in that, mm -hmm. but it just feel like, hey, maybe I should get out of here until the flood's done. Yes. Right? Well, uh, right at the night of Sandy, all the power went off. The power was off for... Weeks. I know right. with me, it was three weeks that it was off. Yeah, so there was really no electrical issues then. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it's scary because of the water situation. So we were talking a little bit at the break about when water backs up through the sewage. Right. Right? Exactly. Some uh, businesses or homes have covered, it's called backup of sewers and drains. And that's mm -hmm. from a French drain you'll see, or the toilet will back up. Now, when that happened during Sandy or flooding, if the water is from the bay or something like that, they test it. This is salt water from the bay. It's not covered. This is a flood issue. Okay. A flood issue. I insured a medical practice in Shipshead Bay in Brooklyn, and they're like blocks, blocks away from the, the bay, but backup of sewers and drains in their basement, it was uh, water from the bay. It was salt water. And they wouldn't cover the claim because they didn't have flood insurance. That's why sometimes okay. you just get that flood insurance policy just for that reason. But even if you had, that's a great, great point. But even if you have flood insurance, if there's a backup of pipes or anything like that, if there's no salt water in it, it's right. not really a flood. No, it's, right? then it becomes a homeowner claim. Yeah. And you don't, if you call the homeowner company, you never use the word flood. 
you've got a lot of water. You got three feet of water from a broken pipe or right. backup of sewers and drains. Once you say the word flood, then they start questioning. What do you mean flood? We don't cover flood. So right. that's the dirty word with homeowners. That's policy. interesting. It never even occurred to me that you could test the water, right? Is it salt water? Is it not? Yeah, it's, it's a great that. point. Mm-hmm. The fl- adjusters do that. Yeah, that makes sense. Make sure the adjuster is your best friend. That's right. That's right. Exactly. And then things go smoothly and things work out for you. All right. So I'm going to kind of back up a little bit on the claims process. So I had a, I have a flood. And the first thing I should do is call the insurance company. Mm-hmm. Now, now I've called the insurance company. We have to wait for the adjuster to come out. They're going to get there as quickly as they can. If a lot of people are flooded, it may take a longer period of time. Correct. So they come out to the property. From a time frame standpoint, on average, how long does it usually take for someone to get back to me with what the dollar amount is on the damage? It depends on how bad the flood is. Okay. If it's a local kind of thing, it's not so bad. But with Sandy, it was it was weeks, and people were upset calling me, and then I would go online and see what I could find out or call, how are we doing with this flood claim? Do you have any money for them? Can you give them a check? You know, so it just depends on how bad the flood is. Okay. Well, what happens if you're waiting during that claims process and it's doing more damage because the water's sitting there? Will they increase the value of the claim? Um, usually when there's a flood, the water will go down within a day. It just goes down. Okay. It doesn't stay because I had the five feet of water, couldn't leave my house because my house was kind of raised up. My We put our car sideways against the garage. Okay. So I was able to get into the car and charge my phone and, Smart. and and everything, but we couldn't go out because the water was five feet. But after a day, it went down. Okay. Okay. So you say that damage is done, it's the instant water recedes. Yes. Relatively quickly. Okay. And, and what the adjusters knew was that there was this black silt on the on the ground. Okay. Um, I also had a, a dresser in my garage for my granddaughter, and when you opened the bottom drawers, there was um, black silt in the drawer. It was in there. And that's how they knew that there was flood damage. Um, We had um, a lot of people were trying to take advantage of the situation. And we had um, a little motel who wasn't flooded. Mm -hmm. And he wanted to get the money. So, um, uh, yeah. Uh. Um, So he took his hose and hosed down his hotel. Okay. (laughs) Uh, It's creative. I know. (laughs) Now, the adjusters know that when you have a flood, the water line is kind of straight and a little yeah. wobbly. But these water lines were up, were and, up down, and down. And they knew. And then when they looked in the drains, there was none of that black soot. Okay. So that's how they knew. And it was they could tell it was fresh water. Right. It wasn't from the ocean. Well, it leaves a residue, I would think, of exactly. salt water. Okay. There wasn't any. Okay. There wasn't any. And... Um, <laughs> I don't mean to laugh. It's so wrong. But I'm just picturing this person in their hotel, hosing everything off, trying to put a claim in. Uh, People are nuts. So, uh, yeah. No, but that's a great point. So you got the, you have the, uh, you can see the salt residue that's there, plus Mm -hmm. all the silt that's there. Right, exactly. And the lines. You're right. The lines. And they know that. And they can, you know, they can smell it. Sure. And they look, because there was this black soot all over. We're in my neighborhood from Sandy, from the water. In salt water, it, does it do more damage than fresh water? Um, it probably does. Okay. Probably does. Because the back of my house is a lagoon, and that's really not salt water. Okay. But it still damaged everything. Mm. Now, going back to the claims process. So now the adjuster has been out there. We're waiting for the adjuster. The adjuster says, hey, it's $40,000 worth of damage. How long does it take you to get your check? That... It depends on the company and depends on how many people, because no one was really expecting Sandy as big as it was, and they were bombarded. And that's why they had to get a lot of people from Louisiana, a lot of adjusters from Louisiana to come up here and help us. Mm -hmm. So anytime I spoke to any of the adjusters, and I could tell by the accent, I said, thank you so much for coming up here to help us. I really appreciate it. Please take care of my client. And, you know, it was just that little touch helped Sure. And got things done because so many people were yelling and cussing at them because um, they weren't doing their job, they say. So there were phone calls forever. I mean, right. this lasted a long time, but we got through it. So then I get my check, and then I can start the work. 
And what happens if the check isn't enough to cover what the damage was? I'm just out of pocket for it? You would go back because usually you would get the estimate too okay. of how much it would cost to repair this water damage mm -hmm. taking up. And what was happening too was the kitchens, they would only replace the bottom cabinets and not the top cabinets. Okay. And maybe the, the cabinets were older and they're match. not going to match. Right. And, you know, so that was one of the issues that you'd have to replace the top to mm -hmm. match the bottom. Um, we, tr we tried our best. Uh, you know, the water goes down, you get estimates, you're hoping to get money, uh, and eventually the check comes. Right. And people got loans to repair the homes. A lot of people got um, homes rebuilt from, uh, they were um, the flood houses. The, there's a house across the street from me that's a flood house mm -hmm. that they were able to get the money to build it. They were very simple homes. Mm. There was no, you know, hardwood floors and granite. It was just very simple. So that brings up a good point. So if I have $250,000 worth of flood insurance on a uh, residential property, what, if the damage is 400000 I have to make up the difference on that. Or can I just take the money and say, I'm knocking my house down and rebuilding it and use that 250 towards that? Um, you could do that, too. Another neighbor of mine did that, too. Okay. He got the 250 and he built up high. He took that 250 and rebuilt his house. Okay. Yes. And then during that waiting process, while I'm waiting to get a check, you better have friends or family that you can live with because... There's no additional living expense. There's nothing. People were living everywhere. I mean, I had people living in my house. I was feeding people because my house was there. Right. Right. And that's what happens. They were these are called the REM houses. And they're beautiful. They were they're small, but people that's how they people got back on their feet again. They got a new house. Yeah, that's so tough because when you look at homeowners policies, like the odds of the house not being habitable, right? On a homeowner's claim, it's not very high. Mm -hmm. Flood, the odds of your house not being habitable, if it's a significant flood, probably pretty high. Yes. The neighbor across the street, as I said, they had a bungalow that was on ground level. And when they finally got back to see it, they asked me to come in and help them. And I did. I went in. I went into the house and it was just there was like three or four feet of water. Mm. And we opened the door and, you know, started coming out. I had my boots on and I went in and I said, everything's gone. Let's try to get what we can save here. And right. that's exactly what we did. We saved things. As a matter of fact, before Sandy, they brought over a big black bear. It had to be about six feet and uh, a religious A, re a real bear? No, no. <laughs> a stuffed animal. I don't know why. He said he bought it in Alaska and it was special to him. So okay. the bear was at my house and also um, a religious statue that I kept until, and some files. I kept yeah. files. I put them up on my dining room table. Sure. And, but everything else, they lost all their clothes, everything, because they only had so much flood insurance. And I think they, he said he only got $40,000 right. from it. And his house was knocked off the foundation because there were no, these yeah. were the bungalows that were built 50 years yeah, on ago. on the slabs. On the slabs. You know, it's so important to be working with the right insurance person, too, because you look at something like Sandy, well, you're impacted as well, mm -hmm. but you're still prioritizing the needs of others in front of the needs of your own, That's candidly. Right. You mm -hmm. could have went to a shell for 30 days, trying to figure it out like other people. None of us had power for three weeks. That's right. I but, did. you know, it's more kind of, all right, you're at attention trying to help people and facilitate mm -hmm. the process. I spent a lot of time here. We had power here. Did you have power here? Yes. Oh, generator? No, it just, there was power here. It was, power was sporadic. There were places that had power and mm -hmm. places that didn't. Right. So uh, this office had power the whole time. Wow. So you we set up came. a cotton here? <laughs> That's what I really wanted it to do. Was there air conditioning? Oh, no, it was cold. It was Remember, October. it snowed yes. right after it. Yes. It snowed a couple of days later. Oh, that's right. That's so terrible. There was a nor'easter. Yeah. And even though we were there, um, we had to evacuate. The other thing that was going on with these homes was, I mean, I was there. And in the lagoon, there was looting. Because uh. what happened when the surge came, they knocked down out the garage doors. Mm -hmm. and, and people were going up the lagoon in rafts and just jumping out and going in and taking things out of the houses. So uh, where I lived, it's one way in and one way out, and they finally put police there, and I had to show ID before I got in. But that was very That's scary. Awful. That's why we stayed to watch our house and everybody else's house. Sure. That, that, That's sad. It is sad. You know, it's, it's just sad. 
Exactly, exactly. As uh, one of my uh, contractors told me that they caught some guy stealing and they just took his boat or whatever it is and they destroyed it and then right. they arrested him. No, oh, it's terrible. It was it was that bad. Oh, it's terrible. I remember when it when it hit because I didn't have power for three weeks. I'm a little further north. I'm in I'm in the Homedale area, mm-hmm. and we had just moved down here. So we lived in Sparta, New Jersey. We're never going to get a flood up there, no. Northwest. Moved down here. We closed on August of 2012, and then in October, I'm like, oh my god, what is this place we moved into down at the shore? Yeah, and it was literally th- three. You know, it was really weird. So we we ended up leaving. My uh, my youngest daughter had she had breathing problems when she was young we didn't have any power so i given my generator over to a friend of mine uh john mcmanman uh who lived over in brielle and we drove up to new england where my parents were because they had they had power it was the eeriest thing driving up route 95 nobody had power no i know no gas stations everything it was surreal it was like being in a war zone it was just so exactly. strange exactly exactly and so is the storm surge separate then the flooding? The surge is the water. The water comes fast. Right. Okay. It just pushes in and that creates the flooding. It's it, yes. And there was a storm surge where we lived. It hit some houses. It didn't hit them all. The storm surge uh, uh, damaged the that ma- uh, mantle-looking road bridge. Yeah, remember. There was nothing left there. Mm. And then it, there also was a breach over the barrier island because of a surge. Okay. And the owner of our company had a house in has a house in Mantaloking, and his house was fine on the ocean, and the houses next to him were gone. So it's just a matter of what hit, and that's what the surge is the the water coming. I think people don't understand the weight and power behind water. I forget what a gallon of water weighs, but it's but it's pretty heavy. And if you've ever been in the ocean, mm-hmm. just kind of like playing in the waves, right? Yeah. And when a wave gets you and pushes you, I mean, it knocks you around. Exactly. It, and when you have that huge wall of water, you know, two, three, four, five foot storm, storm surge, nothing is slowing that down. Exactly. Uh, what about mold? There must have been a ton of mold. Yes. Marianne. Yes. What happened is they do mold mitigation, um, they put some sort of a, a paint on it, a clear paint, and that gets rid of the mold. Okay. So people got rid of the mold. They had, they cut all the pieces that could get mold that got wet out. Like you'll see the houses with just the uh, beams in between, and then up uh, the that weren't wet didn't have mold, but they cleaned out all the mold when they were rebuilding. Okay. That was part of it. Now they must have brought in. There must have been contractors from all over the country here. Yes, but there were also a lot of scams. Yeah. A lot of people gave money, and then the contractors ran away and disappeared. It was sad. That's so sad. I know. I know. A lot of people just terrible. They were, you know, but uh, there were good contractors too in my neighborhood. Yeah. Everybody helped everybody. Everybody. There was one contractor who's lived there and lost everything. And his house got raised, and he helped raise uh, many of the homes in my neighborhood. You know, one of the sad things I saw during Sandy was I, I remember being in the a Union Beach area, driving through, and they were hit pretty hard. A lot of destroyed houses in that area. And there's some that still haven't been fixed all these years later because they didn't have the money. Mm-hmm. They, they Maybe it was paid in full, and they didn't have the flood insurance. And it was really, I mean, if you have money, Everything works out, right? Right, of course. Right? It just works out and gets it done. But those that really needed the money to start, because you figure if you had money, you were able to hire the contractors even before things got out of control busy as the checks started coming in. Mm -hmm. But if you didn't, I mean, you could have been waiting a significant period of time to have your house fixed. Well, if you didn't have a mortgage, you could probably get a line of credit. Right. And... Use that money. Well, the challenge was, is they're not, you can't, right? Because if you have a house that's not habitable... Can't get a line of credit on it. That's, can't get a mortgage oh, on okay. it. Oh, okay. Right? So you're just kind of stuck, and you're stuck waiting. That's true. So that's why you need great people in your corner like yourself trying to push and escalate the, the process. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And that's what I do. I try. So getting to the thanks for all your insight on that and sharing everything with Sandy and that whole claims process. So once I have flood insurance, am I, am I locked in? Is it yes. ever going to change? No. So they could set the flood elevation to 40 feet. It doesn't matter. Right. I'm still going to be grandfathered into that policy. Yes, it'll never go away. Or, you know, if you like if you have a million dollar house and you only have the 250, you should get excess flood. 
Yeah, you know, and that's part of what I'm th- thinking as well is, yeah, obviously people are buying a house that are in a flood zone that are doing a mortgage. They need flood insurance. The question really becomes, do they need FEMA or private? And you're going to do all that research for them. But if I'm in a million dollar house, to your point, Mary, and I have 250000 in flood insurance, I really got to have to start thinking about supplemental insurance right. or private insurance out of the gate that's going to cover a larger dollar amount. We go both ways. Yeah. We get you the uh, 250 FEMA, and then we get you the Lloyd's excess flood and see how much it is. Okay. And then we also go to the private and see how much that is. Mm-hmm. And then, then we, we offer both of them to the client. This is how much this costs, this is how much that costs. What do you want to do? And, right. you know, that's, and the other thing, too, with flood insurance, when there are deductibles, you can get 2000 5000 10000 20000 mm. Even if you got a $20,000 deductible, you'd only save $200. But then you'd have to go and dig into your pocket for another fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 anyway. So it doesn't pay to have a large deductible. Okay. You're not saving any money, not like on car insurance if you go from 1000 to 5000 Right. Uh, but that's that's actually a really good point. Yeah. So paying for that super high deductible doesn't make a lot of sense. No, no. You're only going to save a couple of hundred dollars if that. Huh. Because right, it's counterintuitive. You think yeah. the larger the deductible, the lower the premium. It's not that significant. Not with flood. And that's what I do. If they say, I want a higher deductible, I'll give them every level. And I'll say, you're saving $200 here and maybe 350 here. But then you've got to dig in your pocket for more money. doesn't right. pay. just doesn't pay. Is there anything that we're missing at all about flood insurance? Anything that you think is important for consumers or people in the real estate industry to know? I think we've gotten through everything. Okay. Um, I, I know that there was a, a situation where um, somebody was going to buy a house and the uh, old owner gave, the owner gave them a flood insurance policy from like seven or eight years ago mm-hmm. where the flood insurance was only like $900. Today, that same flood insurance policy is $2,500. So that person, right. I think, backed out of the deal because of the flood insurance being so high. Now, why couldn't they do, transfer it over to them? Because I think they let it cancel. Oh, okay. I think it was just a quote. It wasn't a real policy. But then every year it went up. Mm. That's what happens. So does flood, the cost of flood insurance go up every year? A little bit, yes. Okay. A little bit. Not that much. It's, they're not giving big monster um, uh, increases. Mm-hmm. But if you're starting from scratch, you'll get the monster increase. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Right. You know, and people that are looking to sell their house that have, have, have flood insurance on the property, they need to understand the asset that that is. Exactly. To your point about killing the deal, okay, well, if I'm grandfathered in for 1000 and now it costs 4000 don't let that expire because at the end of the day, that's an asset. That's correct. And it's leverage right. with you selling your house over to the buyer because you can save them a couple few hundred a month. That's right, exactly. Yeah, and that's then they great. keep it. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of little things you you can do to save money. <laughs> now, I know that we were just talking about flood insurance t- today. You handle everything. Correct. So we you handle flood, you handle homeowners insurance, you do condos associations, property and casualty, everything. Is there anything that you don't do from an insurance standpoint? No, you can't. You have to be. <laughs> when I sit with a business owner... They're going to talk to me about their health insurance. Why is my health insurance so high? Sure. Oh, my car insurance is too high. Okay, let's take a look. Let's see why. I don't know why your son had an accident. My homeowners is a lot. I said, yeah, three claims. So, you know, you want an umbrella policy, your business insurance, your workers' compensation. Why is my workers' comp so high? Well, let's take a look. We'll see what's wrong, and we'll try to save you some money. So this is what I do. I sit mm. with everybody and go over because everything comes around in a circle, it all your businessman, your, your own home, it all works out together. And you have to know every little bit. You can't just say, I don't know. You can't do that. Yeah, no, it makes sense. Great. You're obviously an expert. It, now, if someone was out there listening that's a business owner, that's an individual, homeowner, whoever, what would be the best way to contact you, Marianne? Just call me on my phone and I will answer. What's the phone number? 732-359-1920. And then if I don't pick up, it will go directly to my cell phone. We have WebEx. And then I'll pick you up when I'm around the world somewhere (laughs) and I'll talk to you. And what's your your email address? It's a long one. M-A-M-C-M-A-H-O-N at Conover Buyer, C-O-N-O-V-E-R, B-E-Y-E-R dot com. 
That's great, Marianne. So Conover Buyer Associates here, and uh, we're in Manasquan again. Yes. Right? Manasquan, New Jersey. Marianne, you've been fantastic. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. If anyone has any questions about flood insurance or any other type of insurance, you really need to reach out to Marianne. She's an expert. Yes. And I met a lot of people. So thank you so much for spending the time with us today. And I want to thank everyone out there for listening to us. This is Greg Wareham from Your Mortgage Process. Marianne McMahon, thank you so much. And we look forward to catching up with you next week. Bye, guys. Thank you for tuning in to this week's edition of Your Mortgage Process, hosted by Greg Wareham. Produced by Greg Wareham and Nick Pavise at The Social Rift and executively produced by The Social Rift. Thank you again for tuning in and we look forward to catching up with you next week.